Hi everyone, welcome to a new series where I take you all over Japan via ghost stories. Where possible, I will be sharing actual locations and real photos. I may end up covering the same location twice every once in a while, but please feel free to suggest locations in the comments. And please like, share, and subscribe. It really allows the channel to grow, which allows me to make more videos. Anyways, come with me as we look into ghost stories from different regions of Japan. We begin in Tokyo, where most travelers would likely begin. This entry is called the Shadow Woman of Nishi Arai Underpass. This experience was submitted by a woman in her 40s and was submitted on the 21st of April, 2023. But it takes place on a cold January evening. Last month, something really strange and frightening happened when I passed through Nishi Arai Underpass. For those who don't know the Underpass, it's in Arakawa. It's a ward in Tokyo. And it's just a simple underpass. It's used to allow pedestrians to cross beneath the train tracks. It's fairly clean in there, and the lighting isn't bad. But you would be forgiven for seeing it as an underpass, and little more than that. But to us locals, it's more than an underpass. It's quite famous. They say that the underpass is haunted. All the locals have heard the stories. Hi, Jay here. I was actually able to find the location. If you look at the screen now, you can see the exact underpass in question. I will drop the location in the description if you want to see more of the area. Hope this helps provide context. Anyway, back to the story. Apparently, there used to be a railroad crossing above ground instead of the underpass, but due to a tragic accident, it was deemed that it was far too unsafe to cross the tracks above ground. Legend has it that there was a tragic accident involving a mother and her child. They were trying to cross the tracks when they shouldn't have been, and they were run down by a passing train. Some say that this tragic event was the reason why the underpass was commissioned. Some aren't so sure but I definitely think it has something to do with the council's decision. The train tracks are all fenced off now, and we all use the underpass or alternative crossing methods. Us locals never forgot about the tragic accident that happened, and it wasn't long before the rumors about the underpass began to spread around the area. There were reported ghost sightings in the underpass, there are these curved mirrors down there, which allow you to see if people are coming so you don't collide with them. You know, oncoming foot traffic. Legend has it that you can see a mother and her child appear in those mirrors. Some say that a shadowy silhouette of an old woman can also be seen walking around down there at night. I never knew if there was much truth in these reported ghost sightings, but I knew that some locals in the area wouldn't go anywhere near that underpass because they said it gave off bad vibes. As for me, I didn't really buy into the haunted underpass stories. But for some reason, I also didn't go anywhere near it. I don't know if that was a subconscious choice or not, but when I got off at Nishiarai Station, I used an intersection a little further away. Anyways, last month I set off for work. I was on the night shift, so by the time I left home it was already dark and gloomy. It was about 5pm. I actually left a little later than I wanted to, so I was a bit worried about missing my train. I needed to save some time, so I hesitantly decided to use the Nishi Arai underpass that evening. Using it would be quite the shortcut, and I didn't feel like I had much choice. I realized as I was heading down the slope that it had been a long time since I had used this underpass. 
I have to be honest, I was a little scared at that point. The rumours and the legends were swirling around my mind. But because I was in such a hurry, I was able to push the feeling of fear to the side for a few moments. I decided to go straight on and not look around. Just get in and get out as quickly as possible was my attitude. The length of the underpass was about 15 meters or 16 yards. The underpass is well maintained and there are lights down there. It's surprisingly bright and there isn't any graffiti in there either. It's not an intimidating place to walk through. That's what I'm getting at. If you read up on haunted locations in Japan, they always seem to be these run-down buildings or desolate shrines where everything seems unsafe and broken and there's graffiti scrawled on the walls, but the Nishiarai underpass was nothing like that. As I was passing through, I was thinking to myself, why haven't I used this in so long? I can save so much time this way. I was over halfway into the underpass at that point, and as I was about to round the corner to begin my ascent to the streets above, I took one step out of the mouth of the underpass, and that was the moment that I heard something. It was a high-pitched noise, not too dissimilar from a cat meowing or a baby crying. I think if I had heard that noise whilst I was alone in the underpass, I would have been freaked out, but since I was now above ground, well, kind of, I didn't hesitate to look behind me. I spun around to see a woman stood at the foot of the stairs I had just climbed to leave the underpass. She looked to be between the ages of 20 and 30. She was wearing a modern looking skirt, but the most striking thing about this woman was the aura she gave off. It was as if the moment I had laid eyes on her, I knew that there was something deep down troubling her. She looked like depression and sadness personified. Another very strange thing was the fact that I could barely see this woman. She was almost shadowy. There was a very strong sense of darkness that came with seeing this woman. At first glance, I thought that she was just an ordinary woman so I didn't really pay her much attention, and I just hurried along, out of the underpass. I was going to be late for work after all. I made it to the station, and I caught my train on time. My worries about being late began to subside as I took a seat on my train. I relaxed a little, but since my mind was no longer preoccupied, I thought about the woman I saw in the underpass. She suddenly came back to me, I could see her in my mind's eye, stood there at the foot of the stairs, looking up at me. Something didn't seem to add up to me. It was the middle of January. Why wasn't she wearing a coat? It was freezing outside. She must have been so cold. Another thought came to me. When I was passing through the underpass, why didn't I hear her footsteps following behind me? How did she appear out of nowhere? That high-pitched crying sound? Where did that come from, too? The more I thought about it, the more I thought that it sounded like a child rather than an animal. I started to feel very uncomfortable and creeped out. The one thing that really stood out to me as a decisive point was the overall darkness that that woman gave off. The underpass was bright, yet she stood there looking like a living shadow. I could barely see her, when I should be able to see her perfectly. I suddenly got goosebumps on the train. Chills were racing all over my body. Was that woman a living person, or were the legends about the underpass being haunted true? I'm not sure if I can answer those questions, but one thing I can tell you is, I have never walked through Nishiarai underpass again. You wouldn't catch me dead anywhere near it. Nishiarai 
Next, we're headed to Aomori. This one was submitted by a woman in her 30s, and this surfaced back online in November 2020. Until a few days ago, I was a university student living in Aomori City, Aomori Prefecture. I had heard about various haunted locations in my prefecture, but I never dared to go and investigate them. I didn't dare set foot anywhere near something remotely creepy. But that all changed around the time that the summer heat had managed to ease up and the colors of the trees were turning to beautiful autumnal shades. Oranges, deep reds, and golden leaves were everywhere. Some of my university friends and I were eating out in a local restaurant and we spoke about how there must be a beautiful view from Jogakura Bridge at this time of year. Hi, Jay here. I managed to find the bridge once again. If you look at the screen, you will see an image of the bridge in autumn. I will also drop the link in the description box for this one too. Although, if you want to go on the street view, it's not autumn, but you get the general idea. Anyway, back to the story. I knew that the bridge was a famous tourist destination, so I didn't really want to go at first, but all my friends really seemed interested in heading out there, so I said yes in the end. In the car on the way to Jogakura Bridge, I was doing some research. I was looking up the bridge and I kept seeing words like haunted spot popping up in the search results. I wasn't aware of its reputation as a haunted location, so I clicked on one of the links. Jogakura Bridge stands over 122 meters tall, and due to its height, it has become a place where troubled people come to end things. No numbers are reported on how many people have thrown themselves off of that bridge, but it is said to be a lot. There's a small urban legend that goes, if you look down over the bridge, you will be dragged down below those 122 meters by the spirits of the ones who ended things there. I've since heard that some locals refuse to even go anywhere near it. You can also find out lots about that bridge online if you look for it. I was looking at all the creepy stuff and I noticed that my friend who was sat next to me on the back seats in the car was peering over at my phone and she looked at my phone and I saw some concern in her eyes. A little about my friend, she said that she had kind of spiritual powers. I don't know if that's how to phrase it, but basically it means that she can see ghosts. She seemed to be a little nervous once she saw what I was looking up. Despite her looking a little concerned, the overall vibe that day was one of excitement. It wasn't like we all of a sudden had become apprehensive or dropped interest in going. We were still going to go and have a great time, as far as we were concerned. A little while later, we pulled into our destination. We had arrived at Jogakura Bridge. There didn't seem to be all that many tourists out that day. Or we managed to pick the perfect time period to arrive. We were all really happy. We knew that we could enjoy the day at our pace rather than being rushed by an oncoming mass of tourists. I looked over at my friend and she still looked a little apprehensive. She didn't seem to be matching the energy the rest of us were putting out there. I was sure that she would change her energy once we were outside and enjoying the scenery. It's only a short walk from the car park to the actual bridge. The tourists we passed by had big smiles on their faces and they looked like they had had a great day. Even before I got to the bridge, I was amazed by the scenery. It truly is a breathtaking sight. There was nothing but a gorgeous sea of red leaves for as far as the eye could see, all around me in 360 degrees. Everyone whipped out their smartphones, and we were taking photos and videos, but that friend of mine, who I sat on the back seats of the car with, wasn't joining in. She wandered towards the railings, slowly. She wasn't taking a photo. She seemed to be in a kind of days. I thought that it was strange. Something seemed off about her. So I called out to her. I shouted her name. It seemed obvious to me that her demeanor had slightly changed. She ignored my calls to her, and she continued to head towards the guardrail with a blank look on her face. Without responding to any of us, 
Others in the group had begun to shout her name too. She stretched an arm out to the sky, and they made some kind of weird gesture as if her arm had been pulled downwards, and then began to turn her head down as well, as if to look underneath the bridge. I guess that we all didn't really know what to do. I mean, we just stood there gawking at the scene, kind of wondering what would happen next. Next, she did something that required immediate action on our part. She leaned over the rail, as if she was trying to get a better look of under the bridge. The weight that she had leaned forward with was greater than the weight she had on the ground, so she began to slowly go forward, almost to the point of no return. We all raced over to her and grabbed her and pulled her back. We all pulled and pulled, but despite the fact that there were three of us pulling, with all our might, it seemed as if we weren't strong enough to stop her from falling. It was almost as if something had a hold of her and was pulling her over the bridge. We managed to pull her back, though, fully over the guardrail, and I was so relieved when I saw her feet landing on the bridge because I knew that she was safe. I was closest to her face as we pulled her, and for a moment, her eyes flitted, and she began to mutter something incomprehensible. She scared the life out of me that day. As soon as we had her feet safely on the ground, we all decided to rush back to the car. The other tourists must have thought the worst of us, I don't know. Our friend looked as if she had thoughts of ending it all, and it must have been a sight, I guess. But that wasn't how we saw it. She showed no signs. That night, just to be safe, we all decided to stay together to keep an eye on her. She was very unresponsive and devoid of all any kind of emotion. It was truly disturbing to witness. Come the morning, she was her usual self again, though. It was like a switch had been flipped overnight. I asked her about what she remembered we did yesterday, and she said that she remembered we drove to the Jogakura Bridge and we arrived at the parking lot, but after that, she claims she has no recollection. We were all stunned by her admission. I mean, how could she not remember anything that had happened beyond us pulling into the car park? Then she gasped. It was like something had suddenly come back to her. She grabbed her left arm and glanced around the room at our faces in shock, or was it panic? She timidly lifted the sleeve, and I wasn't ready for what I was about to see. Her skin had finger-shaped bruises on it, as if she had been grabbed very vigorously by someone. Realizing this caused her to start shaking with fear. Some of my friends were beginning to panic too. I just couldn't believe what I was witnessing. She said that she was beginning to remember fragments of yesterday in a shaky voice. She sounded as if she was on the verge of tears. And as she looked down below the bridge, she said that she saw a face coming out of the pitch darkness. She saw a man with despair and hatred in his eyes. She could sense it from him. It was as if it was coming out of every pore in his body. He grabbed her. And he was the one who was trying to pull her off the edge of the railing, downwards. She also said that he was covered in blood. Now I can't confirm what she saw, but I know what I saw. And that day, I saw one of my friends go into a kind of trance-like state and nearly throw themselves from Jogakura Bridge. I also saw those horrible, dark marks on her arm the following morning. Needless to say, we never went back. Sticking with Aomori here, I don't know if many people might have heard of this one, so I'm sharing it. I live in Aomori, and there was a small local publishing company that put out this great book a long time ago called The Ghost Stories of Aomori, 
I want to share one with you. There might be different versions of this tale out there, but I think that I've covered the main parts correctly. Years and years ago, there was this famine in Tsugaru, and a woman was wandering in the open fields in search of food. She smelled the scent of rice cooking and went right on up to the house where the alluring smell was coming from. She looked through an open door and saw a pot of rice cooking. She noticed that there wasn't anyone in sight either. The poor, starving woman couldn't resist. She raced over to the pot and began to devour the rice. The owner of the home, perhaps hearing sounds in his kitchen, raced over from another room and caught the woman red-handed. He had a sharpened bamboo spear at the ready. Presumably this was his weapon, and he stabbed her in the chest with it. He took out all of his rage on the emaciated, starving woman and ended her life in his kitchen. But before the woman passed over, she spoke to him. I know it's wrong to steal, but is taking my life right? It seems to be done now, but before I go, know that I curse this house and your family name, and my curse won't end until your lineage has suffered as I have. The legend goes that every child that was born into that man's home was born deformed, and only a few managed to outgrow childhood. Today, eight generations have come and gone in his name, and few have grown up without issues and challenges. His descendants live in a place in Awamori called Fujisakicho. One is blind, and another suffers from alopecia, apparently. The book I read this from was put out in 1973, so perhaps he still has some descendants out there living through the curse that the starving woman put on his family. I'm not sure, though. Is it true or false? Who knows? I just knew I wanted to share it with you anyways. This next experience takes us to Iwate Prefecture and was submitted by a woman in her 50s in August of 2020, but it takes place years beforehand. This happened when I was in my 20s. I used to work at a nursery school in Iwate Prefecture. It was kind of like a daycare, really. We looked after children until their parents came to collect them after work. The latest the children left would be about 7.30 and then us staff members would clean down and get everything ready for the next day. On the night that this experience took place, all us staff members were called into work for a team meeting after the students left for the day. We gathered together in one of the little nursery rooms. After sharing some information and discussions on students and upcoming events, we began to get ready to leave for the night. But a sudden noise stopped us. We heard the sound of footsteps running down the hallway. It clearly sounded like a child was running. We were all so shocked to hear that because it was only supposed to be us employees here at that time of night. Everyone in the room went quiet. We all stood there listening and exchanging glances of disbelief. I thought, oh, Maybe one of the children hadn't been picked up and perhaps one of them had been hiding from us. But it just seemed too impossible though. No parent had ever been this late to pick up their child. It just didn't happen. Plus, how could one of us not realize that a child hadn't been picked up or even failed to find a hiding child in our very small daycare? Before I could think of what to do next, I heard those footsteps running back in the opposite direction. This time there was another noise. We had bags hanging from pegs out in the hallway. They were changing bags for some of the children. It sounded like 
someone had smacked each bag with their hand as they ran past. I knew that sound well. We discouraged children from doing that. I can't tell you how many times a day I said to the kids, don't hit those bags, they'll fall down. Plus, it was super annoying if you were in the middle of a class and you heard that sound. Really jarring. This all happened very quickly, by the way. We didn't have a chance to say anything to each other whilst we stood in silence in our room. We were sure that the entrance door was locked and all the children had gone home. And then a few more seconds of silence passed and I heard one of my co-workers ask, What's this? A ghost? We all looked at one another in shock again. We really didn't know what to think. Since these were everyday noises that we were hearing, we weren't really scared of what was happening. I heard myself say, It's not one of my students. There was no basis for me saying that, but judging the situation solely on the sounds I had just heard, I felt very strongly that it wasn't one of my students. Something just felt different. Back then, we had a co-worker who claimed to have a strong sense of spiritual understanding. She said that she had the ability to sense the presence of ghosts. She was the first to open the door and go investigate. Our daycare was dark and silent. The classrooms were still, and the whole place seemed to have taken on a new atmosphere since the moment we heard those little footsteps running up and down the hall. There was no one in the hallway. There was no one but us in the school that night, and we knew that deep down. No child was playing pranks. We were experiencing something, perhaps, otherworldly. But the woman who claimed to be able to interact with spirits said that she heard a faint, childlike voice whisper let's play we stayed silent straining our ears trying to figure out what on earth was happening and to test if we could hear anything i swear i heard a little voice giggle coming from right in front of me a bodiless voice in the quiet of the night the spiritual woman then said she felt sorry for the presence that was with us in the daycare that night she said that he had met with sad circumstances. You can't stay here. You have somewhere else to go, don't you? She said out loud. Since the moment she said those words, nothing further happened. No phantom footsteps or bodiless voices. We were all unsure of what we experienced that night, but those footsteps we heard, were they the footsteps of a wandering spirit? A child, perhaps? If one person said that they heard it and told me about it, I think I would be ready to argue that they might have been hearing things or just imagining things, you know? If you work with kids all day, the noises that they make can stay with you after hours, believe me. But we all experienced it. So I don't think any of us can say that we were hearing things that night or imagining it. The spiritual co-worker of mine said at a later date the following. Perhaps some unfortunate child who passed over came to our daycare in the hope to play with someone his age. And I, I gotta say that hit me like a ton of bricks. I felt something closer to pity rather than fear after she said that. I prayed for that little boy. I don't care even if there is a logical explanation because I just can't seem to find it. I hope that that little one isn't wandering around alone anymore. And I hope his soul is at rest. Or better still, I hope he's up there with more playmates than he knows what to do with.